Fall Quarter Unit 1, God's Exceptional Choice. God chooses the younger twin. Our scripture lesson today comes from Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. From the be very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. And your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. The other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I am starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look. I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, First, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother, Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil soup lentil stew rather. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Did you know that in both Judaism and the history of Christianity, this story demonstrates God's unmerited grace and love. Although Jacob clearly wronged his brother, God chose Jacob to continue working out God's salvation plan through Jacob's family, and God did not renege on this choice even after Jacob's cataclysmic efforts to ensure the birthright for himself. That in ancient Semitic cultures, birthright in general referred to the right of children to inherit from their father. However, the eldest son would receive a special inheritance upon the death of the father. Often this would be double the inheritance of other siblings. The birthright then was an official mark of the son's rightful place in the legacy of his father and ancestors. Then our passage today describes a dysfunctional family, extreme fav favoritism, competition instead of cooperation, badly misaligned priorities, and deliberate manipulation for selfish gain. The ethical lessons to be learned from Jacob's family are really in the negative. However, when we 
Remember that this is the family God chose to carry out his plan of salvation. God's unconditional love, patience, and grace emerge as the true ethical highlights of this passage. The prof that the prophecy in Genesis 25 verse 23 demonstrates that Jacob's manipulations of Esau was unnecessary. God had already foretold that Jacob would receive the birthright. Instead, of, instead Jacob did not trust God's promise or timing. And by trying to force God's hand, Jacob ended up creating a family tragedy that had him escaping for his life to distant relatives. That Jacob's experience with God highlights not only God's patience, but also God's determination to fulfill his words. God does not give up on us, nor do God's redemptive plans go awry. God proves his words reliable and his character trustworthy. That although Jacob's manipulation of Esau is clearly wrong, it is equally clear that scripture judges Esau harshly for his actions as well. From God's perspective, the spiritual birthright Isaac would pass on involved his family's role in God's plan of salvation. By treating his birthright in such a cavalier manner, Esau showed that he did not take his birthright and heritage seriously. Now lesson biblical background. Old Testament scholars are not certain of the, the exact dates of the events in our lesson today, because in Genesis chapter 23 verses 1 and 2 and chapter 24 verse 47, there are two records of Sarah's death and we can only speculate about the dates around the span of Isaac's life, which is believed to be somewhere around 1895 through 1715 BC. Based on Genesis chapters 24 and 25, Isaac married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, and you'll find that in Genesis chapter 24, verse 47, and also in chapter 24, verse 15. And soon after his marriage, Isaac introduced Becca, Rebekah to his mother Sarah, who died shortly afterward at the age of 127. Genesis 25 records Abraham's marriage to Keturah. You'll find that in Genesis 25, verse 1 and in his old age gave everything he owned to Isaac. And you'll find that in Genesis 25, verse 5. And gave gifts to his sons and sent them to land in the east away from Isaac. Abraham died at the age of 175 years old and was buried by Isaac and Ishmael. And you'll find that in Genesis 25 verses 7 through 9. Genesis 25 verses 12 through 18 lists the descendants of Ishmael and where they all settled. Genesis 25 verse 19 begins the generations of Isaac who married Rebekah when he was 40 years of age. Although there is no biblical record of Abraham meeting Rebekah, it is assumed that he did since Sarah was alive when Isaac married Rebekah. After his marriage to Rebekah, Isaac settled in the region of Negev, also spelled N-E-G-E-B, in the southern regions of Canaan, west of the southern portion of the Dead Sea and east of the land of the Philistines. Isaac lived in a place called Bear Lahe Ro. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 25, verse 11b. And Isaac and Rebekah were blessed with two sons. 
The sibling rivalry between Jacob and Esau is one of the well-known stories of the Bible because Jacob definitely cheated and swindled Esau out of his birthright. But throughout the story, we see the love, unmerited favor, and grace of God at work in Jacob's life. God chose Jacob to continue working out his plan of salvation through the family of Abraham. And despite all that Jacob did, his actions had no bearing on God's promise to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham's family. Our lesson today describes a dysfunctional family, extreme favoritism, competition instead of cooperation, misaligned priorities, and deliberate manipulation for selfish gain. When one examines the actions of Jacob's family, there are few positive lessons to be gained. Nevertheless, we see God's patience, unconditional love, and forgiveness, and we see that the redemptive plan of God cannot be thwarted by human efforts that are driven by personal ambition. Genesis 25, 23 reminds us that all Jacob's plans and schemes were unnecessary since God had already foretold that Jacob would be the heir of Isaac's legacy and blessing. Destroying the trust and love between he and his brother caused him to flee for his life. This passage also highlights that God is long-suffering toward us and that nothing we do changes his love toward us. While Jacob was the initiator of the plot, Esau was not without blame because he sold what was rightfully his to satisfy a momentary desire for food. And in doing this, Esau showed that he did not take his birthright and heritage seriously. A note, in ancient Semitic cultures, birthright referred to the right of the firstborn son to receive a special inheritance upon the death of his father. In most cases, it was a double portion of all the father's possessions which would mark the oldest son as heir of his father's legacy. The birthright was one of the most prominent gifts that a father could bequeath to a son. It not only gave the oldest son physical wealth, but also it bestowed the goodwill and reputation of the father upon the son. This could not be most valuable when dealing with other families in the region. Becoming the next patriarch in the family implied continuing the family legacy through the next generation and beyond. Our lesson explained. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. At that time, he did not know that she would be barren, unable to conceive and give birth. Just as Sarah was barren, so Rebecca was afflicted with the same condition. One would hardly expect that the wife chosen by God would be barren. You need to read Genesis chapter 24 verses 10 through 14. And the Bible does not say when Isaac realized that Rebecca was unable to bear children. If you will remember, Abraham and Sarah were faced with the same situation, but instead of praying, they took matters in their own hands. Isaac entreated, entreated in Hebrew is a tar, the Lord for his wife, instead of doing what his father did. A tar means to pray, plead on behalf of someone or some situation. You need to read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 and 27. And it is not known how long Isaac prayed, 
but that he actively laid his request before the Lord. As you know, throughout scripture, we are reminded to bring our concerns, anxieties, and troubles before the throne of grace. Read Psalm 50, verse 15, 91, verse 5, Isaiah 58, verse 9, 65, verse 24, Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8, and Hebrews 4, verse 16. Even though Isaac's prayers were not prayed in vain, he and Rebecca waited 20 years before the Lord answered his prayers. This shows Isaac's faith and confidence in God because the Lord heard his prayer and Rebecca conceived. Remember, prayer is our most powerful weapon against stress, anxiety, and the rising tide of struggle. You'll find that in First Chronicles chapter 5 verse 20, Second Chronicles chapter 33 verse 13. Verse 22 says, the children struggled within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? When she inquired of the Lord, the Lord told her in verse 23 that two nations were in her womb and two manner of people would be separated from her bowels, and that the one people would be stronger than the other people, and the elder would serve the younger. God told Rebecca that she was pregnant with twins in verse 23, and even before their birth, the twins struggled within her womb, and that you know is in verse 22. Rebecca had also been told by God that there were two nations in her womb and that one would be stronger than the other and that the older would serve the younger. And because of the struggle between the unborn sons, Rebecca experienced a great deal of pain. And when her pregnancy had reached its delivery time, the boys were born just as it had been foretold. Verse 25 describes the twins who were not identical in any way. The first to be born had two unique, unique characteristics. First, he was, he had a reddish, and reddish in Hebrew is admoni complexion that covered his entire body. Second, his body was covered with hair, resembling a garment. Since children are rarely, if ever, born with hair on their bodies, they named him Esau, which reflected his unique characteristics. Verse 24 says that after Esau's birth, his brother came out of the womb grasping Esau's heel, and he was named Jacob. Biblical scholars believe that the actions of the younger twin, even before their birth, was an indication of what the relationship between the two brothers would be like as they grew older, because Esau saw Jacob as a supplanter whose scheming and selfishness were always on display. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 27, verse 36. In verse 27, it appeared as if the rivalry between Jacob and Esau was like that of Cain and Abel's and Ishmael and Isaac's. And each time the elder brother emerged in a less and desirable light. We are not told how much time had passed since the twins were born, but that they grew. Esau was described as a cunning hunter, a man 
who understood the ways of the field, meaning someone who was thoroughly familiar with the ways of animals and knew how to track and kill them. Jacob, on the other hand, was identified as a plain. In Hebrew, the word is tam, man living in tents. The Hebrew word tam means someone who is calm, relaxed, <coughs> upright, without sin, or is honest. But these words hardly describe Jacob, who was shrewd and deeply selfish. The descriptions show the differences between the two brothers. One is a fearless, rugged outdoorsman, and the other is a homebody, content to remain around the tent, taking care of simple chores. Verse 27 shows us one of the reasons for the sibling rivalry. Isaac loved Esau because he was a hunter and he brought meat to his father. And Rebekah loved Jacob for reasons not explained in the passage. Favoritism by Jacob and Rebekah may have been the main reason the animosity between the brothers was so fierce at times. Even today, parents can play a huge role in helping their children to love others in the family, especially their siblings. Since Genesis does not provide any information relating to the passage of time, therefore we do not know how much time had passed between the events of the previous verses and those in verse 29. Verse 29 provides details of how Jacob came to possess the rights of the firstborn son and explains how Esau came to bear the term Edom, making this a naming story as well. According to the passage, Jacob was home cooking and preparing stew. In Hebrew, the word is zit, for stew. When Esau came in from a long day of hunting, exhausted and famished, the Hebrew word zid has a range of meanings and usages in the Old Testament, such as to boil or cook something, or to be proud or it can express an act of presumption. Read Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 12 to 13, chapter 18, verses 20 to 22. In verse 30, Esau insisted that Jacob give him some of the red stew, also known as pottage. He was preparing because he was tired and faint from lack of food and drink, and he was too tired to prepare food for himself, and believed he would perish. Because Esau was famished, he was called Edom. Note, pottage in Hebrew is Nazid, and red is Adam and reddish in color. In verses 31 through 33, we can assume that Jacob and Esau, or it is implied that Jacob and Esau had, had previous conversations about the rights of the firstborn. We do not know if Jacob knew about the patriarchal promise of God or if Rebekah told Jacob that God had promised that the older son would be subservient to the younger son. In other words, we have no way of knowing what Jacob knew about the promise made to Abraham that was passed to Isaac. What we do know is that Jacob did not hesitate to use the stew as a bargaining chip to acquire the birthright. It is conceivable 
that this was Jacob's plan from the beginning, because he knew when Esau normally returned from hunting. Esau replied to Jacob that he was at the point of starving to death, and what good would a birthright do him if he were dead? Satisfying his hunger was Esau's reasoning and did not think or care about the consequences of his action. Jacob therefore demanded that Esau take an oath and swear that he was trading all his birthrights for the stew. Esau swore to Jacob that the birthrights were his and that he was relinquishing all claims to them. In verse 34, after agreeing to give his birthright to Jacob, Esau received the bread and the stew prepared by his younger brother, ate the meal, satisfied his hunger, and departed without a word. Esau's action showed how little he regarded his birthright. Esau despised his birthright, summarizes the entire event, because in the mind and actions of Esau, the birthright was worthless. It was of no tangible value to him. Another note. In some ways, this passage teaches us how many people devalue the gifts of God. The greatest gifts are those of salvation and eternal life. Yet, so often they are seen as worthless to those who are perishing in sin. Esau's character as a fornicator and profane person, you'll find that in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 16, shows God was entirely correct in choosing Jacob over Esau to carry on the birthright. Even though Jacob was younger, though Esau's character was not the basis for God's choosing, he chose Jacob over Esau before they were born. Esau's character showed the wisdom of God's choice. Esau became the father of the Edomites. Some concluding thoughts. We sometimes make rash decisions that are not in our best long-term interest. How do we respond when life does not go the way we think it should? God's plans supersede ours. The story of how Jacob swindled Esau out of his birthright offers several valuable lessons for Christians living in the 21st century today. First, we see how delicate the relationships can be be that exists within a family. Isaac loved Esau for his rugged, rugged individualism and his skills as a hunter. Rebecca loved the quiet demeanor of Jacob and she no doubt nurtured him and had to have shared the, the vision she received from the Lord regarding the younger being served by the elder brother. Each parent bears some responsibility for what happened in their family between their sons. We should be mindful and remember that it is critical that we as parents be impartial when dealing with our children. Second, we come face to face with a man who lacked appreciation for the things that are important in life. Within the ancient culture and in some African cultures today, there was and is nothing more valuable than the rights of the firstborn son. Esau allowed his momentary light affliction of hunger and thirst to cast aside the most precious gift that his father could have bequeathed to him. How often does the attitude rear its ugly head 
in African American communities across America. Third, over all of this was the sovereign will and plan of God, who despite Jacob's trickery, acted to carry out his will. While we would consider this to be an affront to justice, God's plans do not always align with our expectations. His plans are beyond our comprehension and beyond our capacity to alter what he has proposed. Jacob schemed, but God was working out his will during the lives of Esau and Jacob. Jacob versus Esau, a power struggle from the womb. Let us pray. Father, our world today encourages us to be very Esau-like and Jacob-like in our thoughts, words, and actions, to live for the moment and to make the achievement of our personal desires and wishes more important than anyone else's. Deliver us from such an, a self-centered point of view. We celebrate that you have chosen to work through us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, even when we fail to live holy lives. God of grace and mercy, we pray that we may love our neighbor as we love ourselves and you. Grant that we may never engage in activities that will shame your name. Keep our minds on higher holy pursuits. Prepare us so that we can live out your purposes. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.